Hello and welcome to this episode of Own the Journey, where we get to speak with amazing people from around the world. Today we have the privilege of speaking with Dean Ertl, who is a fish whisperer, a former executive with the Boy Scouts of America, and has an artist and, and quite a business leader and volunteer. So we're excited to speak with you. Thanks for being here, Dean. Good morning. Yeah. Well, uh, so for those that don't know your history, talk to us just a little bit about your journey and your time in the Boy Scouts and how you became known as a fish whisperer and, and an author and all the other things. Okay. This may take a while. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I would say you start out at age five. Yeah. Okay. And you end up uh, in New Jersey and your grandfather and your dad and your uncle are all out there fishing uh, in the Delaware River Canal. But between them and you is the Penn Central Railway tracks. Well, they don't want the five-year-old on the track, so you stay away from there. Well, I want to go fishing. Now you stay away from there. Finally, if you're a pain enough, <laughs> they let you come across and you go over there and they give you a cane pole about 10 feet long with about four feet of line on the end and keep you quiet, right? Well, I caught a little sunfish. Mm -hmm. They thought, well, put them in a bucket, the kid will play with the fish and uh, that's it, right? Now I want another minnow. So they put it on there. Well, the next thing is my uncle hears a noise and he turns around and he yells at my dad. The five-year-old is waist deep in the Delaware Canal holding onto this pole and the pole was like this. <laughs> one grabs the pole in my hands, the other one grabbed me and they pulled me out and it was a 24 inch largemouth bass. Oh, wow. Anyway, the story goes that by age nine, the Delaware River had the great flood. The Delaware rose 33 feet. Mm. And the water was gushing all over the place and they were trying to keep the canal and the river from coming together. So what they did is they were putting sandbags on the railroad tracks. Well, you keep the nine-year-old out of the way. Why don't you sit on your grandpa's back porch and see if you can catch a fish? The flood water was coming through such that his garden was now four feet deep oh, in water. Wow. So I'm sitting there with a can of worms off the back porch. They come back and they say, do you have any luck? And I said, well, I didn't get skunked, but it wasn't all that great. And they look at the bucket and they find three little uh, shiner minnows and two little catfish that I caught in his garden. <laughs> and my uncle made the comment, this is where it starts. He said, I swear, he says, I think this kid talks to the fish. Mm -hmm. I, and therefore it was the starting of the fish whisperer. Mm -hmm. Uh, what was the rest of that question? Well, just, just, <laughs> just the history. I mean, how, how you landed. I mean, you, oh, okay. you ended up with a degree in zoology. Well, yeah, well, basically, basically what happened is, uh, as I grew up, uh, I ran a trap line to get my first car. Mm -hmm. Did that, the outdoor thing. Turned around, and uh, when I got, graduated from high school, uh, guidance counselor made the comment that I needed to go out and find a trade because I wasn't college material, <clears throat> which I thought was interesting. Anyways, then two days after graduation, the Army drafts you into the service, mm -hmm. except somehow I flunked the physical. Oh. Don't have any idea how that worked. You have to come back two weeks later and take it again. Well, I went home and told my mother, I said, you know, you go into the army and they give you a gun and you don't learn nothing. I said, it's too bad I didn't get drafted into something like the Air Force or, or something else where I would learn something. Mm -hmm. So my mother made the suggestion, well, why don't you check? Called the Air Force thing down in Trenton, New Jersey. That afternoon went down, passed their physical. And the next day I was on an airplane to Lackland Air Force Base in Texas and I was in the Air Force. And basically, being in the Air Force was interesting because I was in communications and you learn a little bit about a field and how to communicate and how to send messages back and forth. And I think there's where the confidence comes in that you end up getting to a point where, gee, I've got this GI Bill. Mm -hmm. They said I couldn't do this. So I took two art classes at the same time, college art classes. And guy A in both classes, I thought, well, if I can do this, I ought to be able to do college, right? Right. Anyways, uh, so I uh, started out at a junior college, and uh, first semester I ended up with two A's, two B's, and a C. Not too bad. Not bad. The C was in, was in algebra, which I have hated algebra. 
But then, uh, time it was all said and done, uh, when I graduated from SIU four years later, uh, I was married with a one-year-old, and uh, lo and behold, there we were in a situation where uh, my wife had a degree in history, I had a degree in zoology, and we had a problem. What we did is, I had a whole bunch of letters to go out about getting a job. And uh, I thought my wife mailed them. Well, she put them in the glove compartment of the car for me to mail. Oh. We found them the day before graduation. And that's why we didn't have any job offers. <laughs> so you went down to the unemployment office. Uh, by the way, this is how fate works, okay? Right. Unemployment office. And uh, asked this guy, uh, you know, flip hamburgers, anything. I got a family to support until I could find a real job. Well, I was overqualified for everything they had. The next day, the same guy from the unemployment office shows up at my house, wants me to meet this guy. Turns out the guy at the unemployment office was a volunteer commissioner with the Boy Scouts of America. He was a volunteer. And he brought a professional with him, and they wanted to know if I wanted to come to a Boy Scout camp, Pine Ridge Scout Reservation in Southern Illinois, mm -hmm. and teach the fishing merit badge. Wow. Uh-huh. So you see how this is, fate is working here. Yeah. So you end up in that situation, except that I told them, I said, well, how much does it pay? And they said, $50 for the summer. I said, look, I can't even pay my rent or feed my wife or my kid on $50 for the summer. Oh, well, why don't you just bring your wife and kid to camp and then it's everything's free there. Plus you get 50 bucks, right? Well, that didn't stop there either because it went this way. Two days after we're there, some guy quits. And they said, uh, who do we have that's 21 or older that can cook? So they hire my wife for $150 for the summer to cook for the three, 23 people on the staff. Next day, the commissary director wraps his car around a tree. Oh. Telephone pole, actually. Breaks his leg. He's gone. Who do we have that doesn't have much to do? They could order the food for 300 kids a week. They cook them out in their campsites. So they hired me for another 150 bucks and then I had to deal with the commissary, the, the commissary th mm -hmm. thing well, most of the time and try to do the fishing merit badge on the side. And I'm gonna throw one little thing in here that I think is interesting. That maybe is how we get to where we go. There was a kid there that um, 12 year old kid, uh, heavy set little kid that the other kids all teased. Mm. And he came up to me and he said, sir, he says, uh, is it true that if I show up on the dock at five o'clock in the morning, on Thursday morning, you guarantee I can get the fishing merit badge if I show up? And I said, yes. And I said, why? And he said, well, because I don't think I'm going to be able to earn any other merit badges. I'm not very good at this. And he goes through this whole thing. This kid is at the bottom of the pile. Mm. Everybody's messing with him. I go down there at five o'clock in the morning and I see this blob on the dock. This kid tied himself to the dock so he wouldn't roll off and he slept on the dock so he wouldn't not, not show up. Oh my gosh. I took him out in a rowboat to the secret cove and he caught 68 bass and crappie and sunfish that morning. And at the camp that Friday night, he was presented the award, the Outstanding Fisherman of the Week. Yeah. And all the kids loved him. <laughs> Changed the life with one little silly thing. That's amazing. But anyways, we went from all of that to uh, eventually, there was a guy, um, he, was, he, he was on the Wheaties boxes way back then. And he was uh, an Olympian, I'm trying to think of his name. But anyways, he was now working for the Boy Scouts. Mm -hmm. And he shows up and uh, suit and tie, driver for his car, a big limo. And uh, I was there with a pair of shorts and a t-shirt and barefooted and he interviewed me. <laughs> Anyways, long and short of it is, I filled out the paperwork, and uh, somehow, some way, three months later, 
I uh, had an opportunity to work for the Boy Scouts out of uh, uh, Columbia, Missouri was the council. And uh, I was going to live in a place called Eldon, which yeah. is just up the road. Yeah. And uh, basically from that start, 40 years worth of Boy Scout time. That's amazing. <clears throat> and, and through all that, those lessons, you you served over 240,000 kids and supported 125,000 volunteers as a part of, at least, of all the things that you've done. Yeah, well, there was a lot of that, but what I think is interesting about it is that every single job had its had its problems. Sure. And uh, and when you, I would say patience, um, commitment, uh, that unwillingness to quit, you know, mm -hmm. hang in there. Uh, example, uh, the first job in Eldon. Uh, I showed up, we were, my wife and my kid and I, we were living in a trailer. And uh, by the way, back then, you got paid $8,000 a year. Mm. And um, big money. Oh, yeah. Teachers made more than we did, but uh, eight thousand dollars a year. And uh, uh, we we're living in Eldon and there was 400 kids in that district, five county area. And two years later, when I left, there was 2000 kids in that area. Wow. OK. And the reason for it is, is to give you an example, you know where Max Creek and Climax Springs is? Mm -hmm. Well, you go out to these little towns, there wasn't any scouting out there. It was only scouting in the bigger towns. Uh, when I left, there was not a town in that five county area that did not have a scouting program. Mm. Uh, and to give you an idea of how you make it work, let's say uh, Max Creek. Uh, I run into a school night there where you go to the school and you put on a presentation. And then you see who shows up. Well, one lady and one kid shows up. So she wants it bad enough that we held a second school night. One lady and one kid shows up. The problem was is that you had to have at least five volunteers to start a unit. Mm. And all we had was her. And she was a retired airplane stewardess. And her husband was a blind uh, individual that was couldn't do much one way or the other mm -hmm. and she had a 12 year old i think he was no 11 11 years old anyways young fella long and short of it is we convinced the superintendent and the principal and the guidance counselor <laughs> uh, and her husband and and her and they all signed up and the only one that really was working was her and she ended up with 11 kids in her trailer. Uh, and I would come by every single week with the support that she needed to survive. Mm -hmm. And a year later, uh, when some of those kids went up into Boy Scouts and the uh, uh, guy that ran the shop at the school became the Scoutmaster, mm -hmm. then supported him. And we had a pack and a troop there. Nice. It's one of those kind of things where you just kind of go through one thing or another to make it work. But it gets different as you go through because each job posed different kinds of problems. Sure. Well, something that you said I think is pretty intriguing. Uh, in today's world, it's really common for people to get fed up with the job and just move on and, and get, you know, just like grass is greener and, and all that. I, I think what I'm hearing you say is there, there's no perfect job. You're oftentimes better off just to muck it out and get it done and make the best of it. Well, the, to show you what you're talking about, to prove you're right, there were 33 people that joined as professional scouters at the same time when I did. Mm -hmm. They sent us to a place in New Jersey for training, for three weeks of training. Mm -hmm. And then they, then you go back to your councils and you do your thing. 33 people, three years after that training, there was only five of us still working for wow. the Boy Scouts. Five out That's of 33. That's a very good success ratio. Five years, there was only three of us. And to the best of my knowledge, I'm the only one that retired. Wow. 
And I think it's because as I had one guy that I hired at one time, he did a really good job for six months. And then he resigned and I said, why? And he said, I didn't go to college to work this hard. And uh, that's basically how it comes out. Yeah. But I think that uh, carrying this comment a little further, as you go forth, um, you end up with situations that you learn from. Sure. Uh, and if you have the patience and you make the commitment, I can remember working one time from September all the way to May, averaging 80 hours a week, mm. seven days a week. I don't remember getting any time off yeah. constantly because we were trying, I was trying to run two separate districts at the same time, which means doing two people's jobs. Right. Uh, you do those things and volunteers, if you can surround yourself with good volunteers, mm -hmm. you can accomplish anything. Well, that was something I wanted to ask you about. Talk to me about what you've learned about volunteerism and how important it is to youth development and how important it is to society as a whole when we think about all of the extra work that's needed that just isn't fulfilled because somebody gets paid okay. for it. Well, they say that only 1% of the population makes a good volunteer, 1%. Mm. So if you take Springfield area, if you have 250,000 people, what is that, like 2,500 people out of 250,000 might make a good volunteer? Right. But they also say that that same percentage is, is going to be evil criminals, so that's another <laughs> 2,500 bad guys. But uh, to give you an example of, of good people and making it work, um, when I went to Fargo, North Dakota, uh, give you an idea of what that job was like, try and imagine being in charge of the scouting program for the whole state of North Dakota, two counties in Montana, two counties in South Dakota, and 18 counties in Western Minnesota, and everything that happens there is your fault, mm -hmm. right or good or bad. Right. And so as it worked out, uh, when I took that job, I was told that the place was a total absolute mess. 20 years before, Minot, uh, Bismarck, Grand Forks, and Fargo, four councils merged. Mm. Well, they legally merged, but never really merged. They still had four offices, they had their four camps, and they were a million dollars in debt. And this is, you know, back in 19, 1990. There were a million dollars in debt and half the staff was fighting with the other half of the staff and the volunteers in the different places. If you pass some things at one town, the next meeting would be over here in Grand Forks, they'd change everything you did. And it was a, a total mess. Yeah. And I was told by the area director um, that they thought I was the only person that could fix it. And I said, why? And they said, because it's going to take a lot of patience and you're going to have to really make a commitment to fix this. Mm -hmm. So anyways, I went and I was there about six months and the whole world changed in one day. Well, two days. First of all, they were being accused of uh, the old Scott executive had been, he was canned mm -hmm. and I take his place. Uh, there was a, a problem with uh, every week in the newspaper, the scouts had done this wrong or done that wrong. Phantom units or phantom kids, this kind of thing. And uh, I turned around and uh, got contacted by a guy that uh, said that, you know, the newspaper said that the, well, this, this wasn't there. And, uh, but I was running this program in this school. So I got this guy to give me a letter and I took it to the head of the newspaper, the Fargo Forum, and uh, sat down with the head guy. He was also, by the way, a major donor to the Boy Scouts. Mm -hmm and uh, shared this with him. And the next thing I know, that changed. They got off our back because they realized they were feeding a whole bunch of stuff that wasn't true. Mm. Then we ended up with two 
district chairman chose to want to take our program and they wanted me to fire the assistant scout executive. See, they'd gotten the head guy canned. Mm -hmm. Now they wanted me to fire this other guy. And we were at a meeting and uh, they brought it up for a vote and then it got second. And then I turned around and uh, made a comment that I think changed things and it was this. I stood up and I said, look, when you hired me, you wanted me to come here, fix things, mend the fences, and rebuild things. You did not hire me to come in here and fire somebody. And I said, the only person in this room that can can the assistant scout executive is me, and I'm not going to do it. At that point, you're putting your job on the line, right? Sure. And the council president was the secretary of state for North Dakota. <laughs> and uh, he turned around and he stood up and he said, yeah, if this committee's stupid enough to try and force the scout to do this, I'd quit too. <laughs> and then the next guy, the next guy, the next guy. And when they did the vote, it was 20 to two in favor of- Leaving him in. Don't bust, don't mess with it. Right. And that was the turning point of that whole operation. And I was there four years, and when I left, we had almost put the million dollars to rest. Uh, we were serving thousands of kids, and uh, it was a great program, and it still is. Mm -hmm. And I think that basically the, the thing that makes a difference in those kind of places is if you're committed and you tell the truth mm -hmm. and you can surround yourself with the right people, the good volunteers. Uh, you can do fantastic things. Here in, in Springfield, for example, um, I don't know if you know a gentleman by the name of John Pratt. But of him. Mm -hmm. John Pratt is an attorney. Mm -hmm. He was a council president here uh, when I was a scout executive here. And uh, John was one of those kind of people that literally made things work. As a volunteer, he, he did it like a job. Mm -hmm. he, he, if he takes that job, he's going to do it. And uh, you just surround yourself with great people and it makes a difference. Well, and it sounds like <clears throat> like the, the things that we're dealing with in business today as it relates to having the right culture within the business and the right mentality and, and surrounding yourself with a positive attitude rather than kind of the scarcity mentality and that's what you flipped on its head was you had a bunch of people that were a little bit poisoned in that environment and you had to expose them to something that wasn't poison and then all of a sudden it was like oh we can do things in a unified way and when you get people aligned even in a volunteer environment it, it changes the game. Yeah, for example here in Springfield um, I had been the scout executive in Joplin, mm -hmm. but then they sent me to North Dakota. Well, when I'm up there, my wife decides, she says, she doesn't like three feet of snow on the ground, <laughs> 30 below zero, yeah, and, mos and mosquitoes the size of birds. She said she heard that Joplin and Springfield was going to merge and that that I ought to put my name in the pot to go. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, they'll never hire somebody to go back to where they were because I had handled part of this. But uh, she was the boss, so to speak, so I put my name in the pot. And as it turns out, um, it probably was a good move for the simple reason that two of the um, eight people on the selection committee was a council president and a council commissioner from Joplin that I had worked with. So there's two people there who knew me mm -hmm. and knew what I was capable of doing or willing to do. And uh, lo and behold, I ended up getting the job. And uh, the first week I was here, I had six or seven volunteers come in and tell me I wouldn't last a month. In other words, they, 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 the, whole, the idea of this merger was such that one side didn't want the other side mm -hmm. to do anything. It was just stupid stuff. Yeah, politics. And uh, anyways, we lasted, what, 18, 19 years? So I guess we, we killed that okay, one. Yeah. But basically it was done by just 
pulling in some really good people yeah. and doing some good things to where those people that want to be negative, what are they going to say? That's right. And it goes from there. Yeah, maybe it shuts them up a little bit. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it, could, it could. Yeah. So what, what's one of your favorite stories about, about a life? I mean, you talked about the, the young man that was 11 or 12 years old that, uh, you know, became the hero. What, what's a, one of your favorite stories that where the scouts have just changed their life? I'll give you an example here in Springfield. Um, I had a young fella that uh, wanted to be a Boy Scout. We had put to, in Springfield, we had put together a program where uh, we raised a bunch of money and put it in a certain pile over here that if you didn't have a uniform or you couldn't afford a uniform or a book, you couldn't afford to pay your registration, uh, your family didn't have nothing. Mm -hmm. Well, in some countries, in the scouting program, like in Mexico and other places, it's the wealthy families that have got their kids in the program because they can afford it. Mm -hmm. Well, we made it so that it didn't matter what your income was. If you wanted in, you got in. That's awesome. And, well, we raised about $40,000 that first year and set it over here, and we had several hundred kids that they got in because of that. So one of these kids, he's 15 years old. And uh, back then we, uh, I don't know if you remember, uh, over at Bass Pro, there was a program that we had over there, the Rotary uh, Clubs had uh, barbecue program. Mm -hmm. uh, Rock and Ribs, I think it oh, was yeah, called. Yeah, yeah. Well, our Boy Scouts were, we got some of the money from that. And so we would take care of the parking and this kind of stuff. And this one kid, 15-year-old uh, kid, he's over there handling parking, right? And everybody he's talking to, he's telling them all these jokes. Well, maybe the first joke is a Jewish joke, then a Polish joke. But it's the same joke, he just keeps changing who it is. And I tried to explain to him, you, you don't need to do that because you're going to irritate somebody, da 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 well, somewhere along the line, he comes up to me several weeks later and he says, Mr. Earl, is it true that if I become an Eagle Scout, I can go into the, the Army a whole rank higher than everybody else that goes in at that time? And I said, that's true because they represent Eagle Scout rank. Mm -hmm. They consider that a level that was worthy of letting you start out at a higher rank. And um, anyways, his story goes this way. He's a scout. His mother, the only income or job she had was she took care of several rooms in a little like motel area. Mm -hmm. And so therefore she got her room free. His father was in prison. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. They didn't have a thing. Anyways, he comes to camp and uh, worked at camp and uh, enjoyed it. And uh, I gather he did a good enough job that uh, the camp director asked me if, if I had a problem with them hiring him for the second week of camp to work in the kitchen, you know, help out in the kitchen. So yeah. fine, he gets to work in the kitchen. Well, when he goes home from camp, he finds his mother lying on the floor. She died of anaphylactic shock or whatever they call it. So now what is he going to do? Well, this kid now is like 16 or so, and uh, he stayed for a while with the scoutmaster because he had nobody else to get with. Uh, then his father got out of jail or out of prison and didn't last long, by the way. He went back pretty quick. And uh, long and short of the story, uh, we worked with this kid and somehow managed to hang on to him. And two days before his 18th birthday, uh, I went to an Eagle Court of Honor and they pinned the rank of Eagle wow. Scout on this kid. And two days later, he was at Fort Leonard Wood, and he went in a whole rank higher than everybody else. Now, I don't know what's happened to him since, Yeah. but it was one life, just one. Yeah. And if you're working with thousands of kids, thousands of lives. how many lives do you touch? Yeah. I get kids that come up to me that have their kids in the program now, and they know who I am. I have no idea who they are anymore. I've lost track of all, all these people. But yeah, there was, there was there's a lot of kids like that that, that we made a difference with. Mm -hmm. I think it all feeds back to, I mean, when, when you think about it, it just, 
it takes all types. It takes the volunteers in order to make the world work, and um, and it's fun stories like that that, that kind of make it worth it. To, Put in the extra time, the energy, see the benefits, and, and feel the rewards. And a guy like you, who now is, gets to retire and fish a little bit more, it's uh, it's got to feel pretty pretty amazing. Well, for, for, for whatever it's worth, even when I was working, uh-huh. uh, there was still a fishing pole in the trunk. <laughs> uh, there were times, like in North Dakota, uh, or in Minnesota, for that matter, mm-hmm. uh, where you'd be in your car on the road for two or three days trying to cover some towns. And uh, you end up with a, an hour or two before you have to be somewhere and there was a creek down there. What the heck? Take a few casts, you yeah. know? So you just kind of did that kind of stuff. Well, so let's let's talk about that a little bit. So you spent your whole life in the Boy Scouts, but obviously outside and were involved with all of those things, being a guy who spoke to the fish from a, from a very young age. And then you've transitioned to the point where you decided to write a book. So talk to us a little bit about that. You were, you were telling me before we, we started filming that we you had kind of a fun way that that came about. Well, ba- basically what it amounts to is to start backing up just a hair. Uh, I have two sons who are Eagle Scouts, Mm -hmm. and my daughter uh, spent three years in the exploring program. Well, every time one of my kids was in their unit was gonna go on a high adventure trip someplace, Mm -hmm. and they needed volunteers, Mm -hmm. I'll go, I'll go. Which means when they went into the Absaroka Beartooth Mountains in Montana for a week, Uh I was with them. Uh, when they went into the flat top wilderness in Colorado, I was with them. Uh, and what it, you know, I think the first one we went on was uh, a trip to, uh, I'm trying to think, it's uh, Fort Collins, Colorado, in the Cache La Poudre River area, back up in those mountains up in there. Well, I had a fishing pole every time, mm-hmm. and uh, it was fun doing, and we'd go do things. And I think what it comes down to is uh, during the early stages of the pandemic, when uh, my wife was making me wear the mask and all this kind of stuff, and she wouldn't go out of the house. And and, uh, I started just thinking about it. And every time I ran into somebody or talked to somebody or thought about something that was interesting that happened in my life, I just wrote a little one liner down on a piece of paper. Well, you end up with four pages full of one-liners and uh, I finally took those little one-liners and put them in order of when things happened Mm -hmm. and I ended up with 82 short stories but they are all true stories Mm -hmm. it's kind of like if you want to read about the bear that tried to eat me (laughs) it's it's two pages in the book yeah or if you have something to do you want to know about UFOs Mm-hmm. I was at the Air Force, and I can tell you whether there is or is it UFOs, <laughs> and it's in the book. Uh, but at the same time, there's a lot of places in there that uh, uh, life's experiences is just one story after another. It's a life experience is yeah, basically yeah. what it comes down to. Yeah, that's amazing. It's not all fishing. No, but there are experiences that apply to all kinds of things in life. Yeah, you know, there's even one spot in there where this one young lady over here that she said she read the book. Uh, you know, where I, I talk about some girls that, I <laughs> 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 and that was kind of funny too because uh, uh, one one young lady made the comment uh, that there were no boys in our town that was eligible, <laughs> uh, no eligible boys in our town. Mm-hmm. And uh, but anyways. Uh, the book is just full of, of uh, little little things that happen to you in your life. Yeah, and I bet it. you everybody, you know, once you've reached a certain age, anybody could sit down and, and write a book if they wanted to. Yeah. Well, if somebody wants to pick up the book, where, where do they find it? Amazon? Uh, Amazon, uh, Kindle and Amazon. Uh, it's Amazon has it on there. Mm-hmm. I run around every once in a while and I'll, I'll buy it author copies which means i can get them a little cheaper yeah and i'll end up with uh, 25 or 30 of them sitting in my house and i run around if i, I run into somebody at once when i'll sell it to them cheaper than what amazon sells them <laughs> to but uh, yeah it's it's just one of those kind of things but it's fun well good for you um what was it like going through the publishing process i know that that's not always easy yeah, we did the self-publishing thing with a, a lady here in town that helped with it 
Uh, the other thing is I have a daughter that uh, works for the library system and she was my proofreader. <laughs> if it wasn't for her, I think I would have bombed because uh, uh, my typing and, 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 and when you put things in a computer, and, or if you talk to the computer and it puts words in there, sometimes it puts words in there that is not exactly what you were trying to put in there. Right. And uh, my daughter tried to fix most of that stuff, so that was good. Awesome. Well, talk to us just a little bit about how, as, as you went throughout life, you, you picked up artistry. And so now you're, you're an artist on top of everything else, and you're involved with the art systems, and you volunteer here in the community. And, I think the art thing goes way back. Uh, when I was in high school um, in an art class, mm -hmm. um, I turned around and uh, I did my first painting. And then I would tell you, I thought it was pretty cool at the time, but now I look at it and I said, well, that was not a very good painting. <laughs> uh, but then uh, when I was in the Air Force, um, maybe my first real attempt at doing something was I was on Okinawa mm -hmm. and uh, I had been there almost 18 months and uh, I was getting ready to come home on leave and when you're getting paid $79 a month and you're going to go home on leave for 30 days um, you don't have a whole lot of money to go play with so I turned around and I just went down to the beach and I said, okay, I got waves, I got sand, I got a few rocks and occasionally a tree. And I did about 15 or 20 little bitty canvases about so big, just little landscapes. Mm -hmm. And there was a, uh, a boat that would come in once a month uh, to the harbor and they, people would get off the boat, you know, and, and run around for three hours and then get back on, right? Mm -hmm. So I went down there, pair of shorts, barefooted, holy t-shirt, and I had all these things lined up along the sidewalk. And uh, lo and behold, I, I, I made 400 bucks wow. in, in less than three hours. And that was the first time I actually tried to sell anything. And then uh, I came back to the States and I was stationed at Scott Air Force Base in Illinois. And occasionally I would just for fun paint something. Mm -hmm. Back then I was painting with oils. And I remember I had three paintings that I kind of liked and there was a down in Belleville, Illinois that was going to be a little art show. So I turned around and I figured, well, I don't want to sell them. I, I want to keep these, but I, I'll, I'll enter them in there just for fun to see if anybody likes them. So I put a $50 price tag on each one. So you know, that would be fine, right? Well, I went across the street and, and got a, a soda and a donut. I came back and one of my paintings already had sold. It was gone. So I upped the price to $75 on the other two. Uh, and then after that, very little. Every once in a while I would do something. I'd get into a deal where I'd do something for a few weeks or something and then I wouldn't. Yeah. Well, when I retired in 2012, I came to the conclusion that uh, maybe I ought to, you know, you got to have something to do yeah. other than just fish. And so I worked at it and I started doing some more. And it got to the point where, uh, for example, in the last in the last four weeks, I've sold four paintings. Wow. That's not bad, a painting a week. Yeah. But uh, I ended up with uh, paintings down at Hammonds Hall, mm -hmm. on, and, uh, and I've had them down at the nearly famous deli. Right now, I've got paintings down at the Conservation Center, or the Nature Center yeah. on the south side of town. Um, I've had them down at the Creamery. I've had them out at the airport. Uh, all over the place and I know that uh, see coming up I've got I have part of the fourth floor at Hammonds from November to January I'll put about a dozen paintings up there and I do it and it's fun and, and I don't, I'm not doing it to make a fortune or anything and I'm not I'm not going to be Rembrandt <laughs> but at the same time uh, uh, you do the landscape and uh, and some of them I really, really like, and some I, I, I have no idea why anybody would want to buy them. So, and, you know, people buy them anyway sometimes. 
but uh, no, it's, it's, it's just fun. And uh, but what it amounts to is you can turn around and get involved in a painting. Mm -hmm. What I mean is, uh, for example, I had, a, I had three or four pictures of Yosemite that I had. And I threw it together and I ended up with a painting that's about this big of Yosemite of the Falls uh, and, the, and the river coming down and all the trees and this real bright sunlight coming through the top of the mountains. It's a gorgeous painting. Mm -hmm. And uh, you just get carried away with it. It's, it's kind of like telling a story. And when you paint it, and I'm painting with acrylic paint now, mm -hmm. which is cool because it dries a lot faster. And if I screw something up, I can go grab something to drink and come back and <laughs> fix it, say, and go from there. Matter of fact, that's a good idea. <laughs> But that's basically, uh, it's most like fishing, it's a hobby, uh, but it also pays for my fishing is the best way to put it. Yeah, that's good stuff. What, what would you tell somebody who's, who's an aspiring artist or thinking about going into that but nervous about whether or not somebody would actually like their stuff? There are organizations for example, the Visual Arts Association of Springfield. Mm -hmm. I'm a member of that. Uh, the Springfield Regional Arts Council, member of that. Uh, use the Visual Arts, for example. Um, they meet mostly once a month. Uh, and by being a member, you get the opportunity to put things up at Hammonds Hall. You get an opportunity to put things up at the uh, nearly famous deli and other places, the libraries. And there are people in there that are way better than I am. And there are people that are way worse than I am. Doesn't matter. It's just a place where you can meet people. You can learn from people and uh, share your, your, your interest and your love of something. Mm -hmm. And they do the same. And uh, I would just say that if somebody had an interest uh, and they want to do it, they could go ahead and become part of or something like that. And just get out there. Just, just get out there. Mm -hmm. Go do it. Just go do it. Oh, that's amazing. Well, <clears throat> when we when we think about some of the the younger people, and you know, it sounds like you do a lot of landscapes and some of those kind of things. To talk to us about the creative process, like what, when you have an empty canvas, what what make where, where do you start? Okay. Um, I start two different ways. Mm -hmm. um, I, I had one at, uh, down at Hammonds Hall that uh, in a show at Hammonds Hall that came in second place in the, in the, in the show. Nice. And it was a buffalo. Uh, try and imagine a real bright but foggy morning sunlight sky and a whole herd of buffalo, but one big buffalo staring at you. And it's called the Sentinel, he's the guard. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was a painting all about, about so by so. It wasn't all that, it wasn't a real big one. That painting, the buffalo, I got picture. I went to the library and got pictures of buffaloes. So I had maybe a dozen different pictures of how, what they look like in different positions and so forth. And from that, I created the main buffalo. The rest of it, I winged, mm. okay? Well, some paintings where you start out with a picture, for example, pictures from Yosemite that I mentioned, mm -hmm. you're using photographs that you've taken or someone else has taken and given them to you of that. Well, that's where you're starting with something. Uh, I did one painting that, um, I just started throwing paint on the canvas and I threw a little more on there and then I turned around and said, hmm, that really looks like a neat mountain right there. Uh, and this over here it looks like a deep, deep gorge or a valley, just, just throwing it up there. Well, now I see something and once I see it, then I make it happen. In other words, start with nothing and then just make it happen. And that particular painting uh, ended up being 
a night scene with a bright moon uh, and big storm clouds, but the light from the moon shining through. Mm -hmm. And way down in here is a stream that comes by you this way. It comes around in front of you and the mountains on either side coming down. And, uh, and the title of that particular painting was A Storm Cometh. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, that one uh, won a prize at a, at, down at Hammonds Hall a couple years ago. Hey, well, it sounds like kind of like getting out there. I mean, you just start. You just got to put yeah. something up there and get going. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, uh, that's, that's basically how you do it. But it, it's kind of like whether you're working for the Boy Scouts or whatever kind of job you've got, or whether you paint, or whether you write a book, or you have a hobby like fishing, mm -hmm. it comes down to commitment, uh, persistence, and uh, not being afraid to trip and fall down, so to speak. Yeah. You know, get, you back, get up. back up and keep working at it. And if you do that, uh, for the most part, you're gonna end up winning. Well, Dean, thanks for the impact you've had on our communities and our country and serving in the military. We appreciate everything that you've done because it's obvious that you've made a difference. Well, thank you. Yeah. So as we wrap up, one of my favorite questions to ask people is what's one of the best pieces of advice that you've ever received or that you'd like to share? There was a gentleman who was my first immediate supervisor when I lived in Eldon, Missouri. Uh, his name was Wiley Tracy, mm -hmm. and he was my field director. He lived in Columbia, Missouri. Wiley uh, basically told me one time that uh, uh, don't get discouraged, hang in there, be persistent, and, and don't be afraid of putting the time in necessary to make it work. And uh, what it really comes down to is if you are persistent and you put the time in there needed, um, you, you, you can win and you can make it work. And the other thing is, is that when you make it work and you make something come out correct, mm -hmm. uh, it's an example. Uh, here in Springfield, uh, when I got here, the Boy Scout office was a little bitty house up on Sunshine. Mm -hmm. And uh, they ended up selling that. And then uh, we were in uh, down on Kimbrew between the Army uh, sign up place and another place, a little hole in the wall spot there for a while. Um, and I guess I was here about four or five, maybe six months. And the gentleman who's long has passed away, Mr. Ross Osborne, I don't know if you ever knew him or not, yeah. but he was the council president. And we were coming back from a Boy Scout function in Pittsburgh, Kansas in a snowstorm. And he hit me up. Uh, he said, Dean, he says, uh, you know, we've always talked about having our own service center, a place that would really be a neat place and be a focal point, a spot, our headquarters for our, our program. He says, what do you think about that? And I told him, I said, well, you don't want to do that or try to do that when your scout executive is leaving. If you're going to do something like that, you do it when he first gets there because then he's gonna be there long enough to guide you through this thing. Mm -hmm. Because a lot of times people will only stay put for three or four or five years. And he turned around and uh, he said, do you really think we could do this? And I said, you can do it if you want to and you get enough good people behind you to work at it. Mm -hmm. So we held a meeting and we had about 30 people there and the overwhelming majority of these people said, well, you know, we, we said, well, we were going to need to raise over like over four million dollars oh, to wow. do all the stuff we needed to do. And basically, no, those people did not believe that it was possible. Boy Scouts can't raise that kind of money. Well, you could stop right there. But Ross Osborne, Paul Kirk, myself, and then half a dozen other people decided to uh, give it a shot. And it took us five years. 
But in that five years, we raised $5.2 million. Wow. Built the service center that we've got now and put money into both camps. And, and, and the other thing is when it comes to raising money, one of the things I found is if you don't ask, you can't get it. That's right. You don't ask, you can't get it. So you can wishful think all you want. But the, I'm not, we're not mentioning any names here, but uh, there was one, uh, well, I'll mention it. There was a, a Mr. Wheeler, uh, and I think he had owned a whole bunch of, uh, of uh, grocery stores or something and, and had gotten out of that business and was basically sort of retired and just had lots of money. Well, we got permission and went in there to talk to him. And we were making our little pitch. Mm -hmm. And five minutes into this presentation, he turns around, stops us, and he says, "Well, how much are you trying to raise?" And at that point, we told him, "Well, we're we're we're, gonna, we're trying to raise four point two million dollars. We we were going to hopefully get five thousand dollars for this guy or something." Anyway, he turns around and says, "Well, I'm pretty well stretched out at this point." He says, "I can't do four point two million, but if I do two, can you do the rest?" <laughs> and at that point, yeah, I think we could. We could. We, we, I think we could do the rest. Well, to show you how things work, he made a commitment. Out of no place, thirty days later, he died. Oh my gosh! And at that point, what happens to that gift? Right, it's, it's out there like this. Ross Osborne and myself. Uh, we did everything we could to figure things out. We figured out who was going to control what was left. Mm -hmm. And uh, we went and tried to make an appointment with this individual and couldn't get in, couldn't get in. Well, finally, uh, I got a hold of Mr. Osborne. At that time, he was on vacation. In, uh, in Hawaii, I think, mm -hmm. and he called this guy from Hawaii. If you got a council president that has some position in the community, that helps. Yeah. He finally got a hold of this guy and he said, uh, Dean Earl and I would like to visit with you. If you'll give us 15 minutes, we promise we won't bother you anymore. Because we've been, we were weekly. Yeah, just Nibbling. Mm -hmm. So he agreed. So we went in there and we made the same presentation to him that we had made to his uh, father-in-law, I think it was, and got to that point where Mr. Wheeler had turned around and said, I can't do 4.2, but if I, if I do two, can you do the rest? Mm -hmm. And the guy looked down at the table and he realized, he realized, he, he said, yeah, that's exactly the way he would have done it. And he says, I can't, I can't do $2 million, but he gave us a check for a million dollars. Wow. So what I'm saying is, persistence uh, and committed to getting it done that's how it works yeah that's what it means to have a successful life and career and everything else and the other one other thing I might mention and this is a retirement thing yeah when you get ready to retire you need to be in a position where every week when you get up in the morning, you know that week there's some things out there you have to look forward to. Mm. It's like in my case, I can look forward to going to a rotary meeting on Tuesdays. Mm -hmm. I can look forward uh, once a month on a Monday to meet with a whole bunch of old scouters. We go out and have lunch once a month. I can turn around and have lunch every Wednesday with my oldest son. Mm -hmm. I can turn around and say, well, I'm going to go fishing on Friday. Uh, I can turn around and say, well, I've got an art meeting uh, and I'm going to go to that. I'm going to put some stuff up at Hammond's Hall. You've got to have things to look forward to. And if you do, you're going to stay happy and hang in there and, and life goes on and it's good. It's good. Have something to look forward to. You don't want to be one of those people who spends the rest of your life after you retire watching TV like this. Yeah, that's right. Because then you're not going to last too long. <laughs> <laughs> well, Dean, if I could raise a glass to you and I'll say cheers to you. And oh, I can do that. Yeah. There you go. Cheers to you for owning your journey. Well, thank you very much. Thank you.